How many times have you heard the expression, you are what you eat? You are what you think? You are what you love? You are what you wear? Uh, you are what you repeatedly do? You are what you attract? This morning, we'd like to add one more of those things to the list, a biblical one. However, first, we want to study one of the main problems that Israel had as a nation. I suppose we could say that their main problem was that of rebelliousness. However, one of the ways that that manifested itself was in the form of idolatry, which is odd since the first two commandments that we just had read for us prohibit idolatry. Not having any other gods before us, making no image, no uh, molded or graven image, or bowing down and worshiping it. And yet, this is what Israel struggled with for centuries. At times, they only flirted with idolatry, but by the time of the captivities, they were totally immersed in it. Now, what we want to ask is, how did God deal with that? How did he deal with their continuous affection for idolatry. We find that he challenged them as in a court scene. We're going to be reading several passages from Isaiah. If you'd like to start uh, with us, we're going to begin with chapter 41, verses 21 through 24. The next seven chapters have several passages relating to the subject of idolatry. So let's read the first one, beginning with Isaiah 41 and verse 21. Present your case, says the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, says the Lord of hosts. Let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things what they were, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, or declare to us things to come. Now this is a mocking challenge to those who adhere to idolatry. Let, let your idols do this, is what God is saying. Show the things, continuing with verse 23, show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. Yes, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and see it together. Now, when he talks about doing good or evil, he means bringing good things upon them or bringing bad things upon them. Let your idols do this so that we can all see it together. Indeed, you are nothing. And your work is nothing. He who chooses you is an abomination. The Israelites who chose idolatry over God were an abomination. So we can't uh, see these things uh, that they are doing. We can't uh, find any predictions that they have made. We can't uh, find anything in the future that they have prophesied of that's going to come to pass. They don't have any power. Uh, without uh, losing your place here, you might want to recall what Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses 20 through 22 says. And this was given in the law of Moses. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, 
or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? Answer, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet who has spoken it presumptuously, you shall not be afraid of him. Well, that's exactly what these false prophets, that's exactly what these idols could not do. They could not protect, uh, predict the future. They couldn't do it. They didn't have the power to do it. And we'll see why in just a few moments. Jehovah's prophecies always come to pass. You, you idols, God says, go ahead and show us what you can do. God will actually do something. You go ahead and, and do something wondrous. We'll all watch. But of course, the idols had no power to do that. Go ahead and bring evil on the nation or bring good. Just, just so you declare it ahead of time so that we can see it fulfilled. No, no power to do that. The fact is, God says, you are nothing. That's the fact of the matter. Those who choose you, especially over Jehovah, are an abomination. And so God challenges them. It's the same reason that we challenge false doctrine. That we challenge error. Because it has no power to save. Just as the idols had no such power. Next, we want to notice that God shows us the absurdity of idolatry. And this time we want to look at uh, Isaiah chapter 43, verses 9 through 13. Isaiah 43, beginning with verse 9. Let all the nations be gathered together, and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring out their witnesses that they may be justified, or let them hear and say it is truth. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. You know, it's interesting that all of the gods and goddesses had a point of creation. At a point where they came into existence. They did not exist before now. Now they exist. They're someone's son or someone's daughter or uh, whatever. But they had an origin. God has no origin. He was not formed. He has always existed. And there was no God before him. There will not be any God after him. Verse 11. I, even I, am the Lord. And besides me, there is no Savior. I have declared and saved. I have uh, proclaimed. And there was no foreign God among you. Therefore, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am the Lord. Indeed, before the day uh, was, I am he. And there is no one who can deliver out of my hand. I work, and who will reverse it? So there is a second passage dealing with idolatry. The point is that idols are useless. They do not see and they cannot know. 
Again, uh, keep your place here, but we want to turn to Psalm chapter 115 and begin reading with verse 3. Psalm 115, beginning with verse 3. But our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. Now that's getting us a little bit toward where we're going, but we still have uh, a few more things before we actually get there. These are made by men, and uh, they are not anything that you would want to be involved in. They have no power. They can't see. They may have all the appearance of these things, but they can't see, smell, taste, touch, whatever. They simply do not have that power. And uh, so they are... Made by what? What, what? what is used to make these idols? Well, uh, a piece of wood. You make it with a piece of wood. Now, wood has some good uses. You can uh, warm yourself with it. You know, you cut down uh, a tree or, or a part of a tree. First of all, you got warm when you cut it down. But... Uh, Primarily, we're thinking of placing it in a fireplace, a stove, or whatever, lighting it, and uh, it burns, and it warms you. So with that wood, you're able to warm yourself. Then you can cook food over it. That has a very good application, doesn't it? Cook food over it. And then there's a third thing you can do with it. You can worship it. You take it and you carve it and you paint on it and some eyes and ears and then you fall down and worship it. What a versatile thing. You can warm yourself with it, cook over it, and worship it. And you expect this idol to deliver you? You expect something that you carved and created to deliver you from distress? Well, let's go to some other passages of Scripture in Isaiah chapter 45 this time and uh, verses 18 through 20 because we need to see the contrast between idolatry and the true and living God. For thus says the Lord, Isaiah 45, 18, who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I did not say to the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, you who have escaped the nations. They have no knowledge who carry the wood of their carved image and pray to a God who cannot save. Tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Why would anybody choose idolatry? With all of its shortcomings and obvious flaws. 
Why would somebody choose the fake over the genuine? Well, let's go uh, back to uh, number three, uh, the second passage from Isaiah 46, uh, verses 9 through 11. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. Now, you don't want to see a movie with somebody like this. You know, I wonder how this is going to end. Oh, I can tell you. No, but God actually knows. He actually knows the end from the beginning. There are no surprises anybody's going to throw in there that he's not already aware of. He knows about what is occurring. He knows the end from the beginning. Uh, and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel from a far country. Indeed, I have spoken it and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. That reference is to perhaps bringing Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon, bringing them up to capture Israel, to take them captive, to destroy Jerusalem. God says, I, I can do that. If I purpose it, it will be done. Now, what's the ultimate outcome? Let's go to Isaiah chapter 47 and verse 8. Therefore, hear this now, you who are given to pleasure, who dwell securely, who say in your heart, I am, and there is no one else besides me. I shall not sit as a widow, nor shall I know the loss of children, but these two things shall come to you. In a moment, in one day, the loss of children and widowhood. They shall come upon you in their fullness because of the multitude of your sorceries for the great abundance of your enchantments. For you have trusted in your wickedness. You have said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge have warped you. And you have said in your heart, I am, and there is no one else besides me. Therefore, evil shall, not, uh, evil shall come upon you. You shall not know from where it arises, and trouble shall fall upon you. And you will not be able to put it off. And desolation shall come upon you suddenly, which you shall not know. Stand now with your enchantments. Notice how God begins to mock them and the false philosophies that they have subscribed to. Stand now with your enchantments and the multitude of your sorceries in which you have labored from your youth. Perhaps you will be able to profit. Perhaps you will prevail. You are wearied in the multitude of your counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, and the monthly prognosticators stand up and save you from these things that shall come upon you. Behold, they shall be as stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. It shall not be a coal to be warmed by, nor a fire to sit before. Thus they shall be to you with whom you have labored. Your merchants from your youth, they shall wander each one to his quarter. No one shall save you. Why would people continuously put such trust and faith in things that cannot save or profit in any way? God has challenged idolatry. He has shown the failure that it has to predict the future. He has shown the folly of its very nature. And he has shown the futility 
of its ability to save. God has no respect for idols because they have no power. And therefore he mocks and ridicules them. And even those who trust in idolatry. Hey, what do you got there? I cut down a tree. Oh, what are you going to do with it? Well, I'm going to eat. I'm going to get warm. And I'm going to put part of it as an idol. How foolish. It has no power. Now you might say, oh, those rebellious Israelites. It took captivity before they finally realized that they were worthless. It it took being uh, taken to another nation before they learned. But what does that have to do with me? Hmm, It's pretty easy to look at somebody else, isn't it? What does that have to do with me? Well, before we answer that, let's look at Ezekiel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Ezekiel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And this is going to bring us back to you are what you... hmm. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house which has eyes to see but does not see, and ears to hear but does not hear. For they are a rebellious house. Do you see what's happened? You see the relevance of the title that we're talking about today? You are what you worship. The idols had eyes and ears, and so did Israel, but neither could see nor hear. They became like what they worshipped. But that was back then, somebody might protest. Ah, Well, the Apostle John says it's now. He closes his first epistle by saying, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. He wasn't talking about those idols back then. He was talking about other types of idols. So what is it that people generally idolize today? No, we don't cut down a tree and make a, uh, something to worship. But what do we do? Well, let's take a look. There are many, many more than what we're going to list here. But let's just look at four. The first one is wealth. Those in poverty seek wealth. Those who have wealth seek more wealth. We make it, we earn it, we invest it. Many people play the lottery to win it. Just envision cutting down the tree and worshiping it. Money, likewise, has no eyes and no ears. Uh, There is uh, no way that money can predict the future. Just ask the year 1929, if you don't believe that. And it cannot save. It doesn't have the power to save. Remember what Jesus told the uh, two brothers? Uh, One wanted him to divide an inheritance, and he said, Who made me ruler or judge over you? And And then he issued this warning, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. And then he gave the illustration of the rich farmer who all he could think about was tearing down his barns to build greater barns to have even more wealth. But his soul was going to be required of him that night. And so whose would that be then? A second thing, especially, that this society worships is sex. What product is not sold by enticing women? Have you looked at the covers of romance novels that women buy? Almost every TV show has as the plot adultery or covetousness or both. 
The porn industry is estimated at about $10 billion a year, although some claim it is far higher than that. By the way, that's about $3,000 a second that is spent on that. Hollywood makes about 600 movies a year. Maybe two or three are worth watching. Oh, that's not the point. Uh, they make 600 movies a year. Porn movies number about 13,000. What about various cable channels? People are worshiping the creature rather than the creator. It's folly to do so. It has no prophetic value unless you use it to forecast doom. It cannot save. The next thing is that of entertainment. By the way, Solomon per pursued all three of these, did he not? Solomon pursued all three of these. And that pursuit he called vanity and a striving after the wind. But as far as entertainment goes, we have Disney, Universal, Six Flags, movies, television, radio, uh, novels. And where does all this get us? It's all created by man. True, it's more spectacular than wood. But ultimately, it is still useless. And then there is comfort that we crave, but it does not save either. You know why evangelism is often so hard to do in this country? You know, you read reports of missionaries. We had Bible study. Fifteen people showed up. Uh, you know, people were converted uh, in some countries by the hundreds, by the thousands. You don't get any reports like that here. Why not? Because people are comfortable. They don't really feel a need to hear the gospel. They have comfort. So it's hard to evangelize those who have all the material possessions they could want and all the comforts that they have. And by the way, that same comfort is very likely to keep us from evangelizing because we have so many things we enjoy and that we do. Convenience is the order of the day. By the way, for all your computer friends, you might ask, do you have an app that will get you to heaven? I have them for everything else. What have you made an idol and can it save any more than that of Israel? It may be more high tech than a block of wood, but can it save? No, of course it cannot. You are what you worship. But is what you worship worthwhile? Can it save? Can you count on it? Can you do anything with it in the day when you'll need help? Will it be able to help you? If you want to idolize anyone, how about Jesus? Only his blood can save you from your sins. None of these other things can, but his blood can. He shed that blood on the cross, and there is no substitute. There is nothing else that man has created that can do any good. There is no other God. They are all useless. And those who trust in those things are an abomination. Hopefully, you're trusting in the right thing. Hopefully, you're trusting in Jesus because he only has the power to save you. His blood only has the ability to wash away your sins. And if you have not had them removed, then you might give that 
some consideration. Give up some of your personal comforts for a little while and, and consider what's really important in this world. There is probably in the part of somebody's mind, well, wait a minute, I can, I can not turn loose of all of these other things. I can, I can have God and some of these other things. You don't want to worship the other things, though. You don't want them to be so important that they take the place of God. No, God didn't say to Israel, you shall worship me and you can have some lesser deities too. No, have no other gods. No other gods. And we don't want to be trying to hold on to God and all of these other things at the same time. Only Jesus can wash your sins away, not Jesus and somebody else, not Jesus and these other things. No, just Jesus' blood can wash away your sins. If you've already obeyed the gospel, have you gone back to the world? Are you worshiping some of these other things? Do they take precedence over God, over Jesus? Then you should repent. If we can help you today in that regard, please let us know while we stand. And